This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. Years ago, Edward Steichen of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City created a monumental exhibit of photography titled The Family of Man. It consisted of 503 photographs from 68 countries and covered the entire gamut of human life from birth to death. The prologue to the exhibit was written by the poet Carl Sandburg, and from it I now quote, The first cry of a newborn baby in Chicago or Zamboango, in Amsterdam or Rangoon, has the same pitch and key, each saying, I am, I've come through, I belong, I am a member of the family. People flung far and wide, born into toil, struggle, blood and dreams, among lovers, eaters, drinkers, workers, loafers, fighters, players, gamblers, here are iron workers, bridge men, musicians, sand hogs, miners, builders of huts and skyscrapers, jungle hunters, landlords and the landless, the loved and the unloved, the lonely and abandoned, the brutal and the compassionate, one big family hugging close to the ball of earth for its life and being. In a seething of saints and sinners, winners or losers, in a womb of superstition, faith, genius, crime, sacrifice, here is the people, the one and only source of armies, navies, work gangs, the living, flowing breath of the history of nations, ever lighted by the reality or illusion of hope. Hope is a sustaining human gift. Everywhere is love and lovemaking, weddings and babies from generation to generation, keeping the family of man alive and continuing. Everywhere is the sun, the moon, the stars. The climates, though meanings vary, we are alike in all countries and tribes in trying to read what sky, land, and sea say to us. Alike and ever alike we are. On all continents, in the need of love, food, clothing, work, speech, worship, sleep, games, dancing, fun. From tropics to arctics, humanity lives with these needs so alike, so inexorably alike. Hands here, hands gnarled as thorn tree roots and others soft as faded rose leaves, hands reaching, praying, groping, hands holding tools, torches, brooms, fishnets, hands doubled in fists of flaring anger, hands moving in caress of beloved faces, the hands and feet of children playing ring around a rosy, countries and languages different, but the little ones alike in playing the same game. Here are set forth babies, arriving, suckling, growing into youths, restless, questioning. Then as grown-ups they seek and hope, they mate, toil, fish, quarrel, sing, fight, pray, on all parallels and meridians, having likeness. The earliest man, ages ago, had tools, weapons, cattle, as seen in his cave drawings. And like him, the latest man of our day has his tools, weapons, cattle. The earliest man struggled through inexpressibly dark chaos of hunger, fear, violence, sex. A long journey it has been from that early family of man to the one of today, which has become a still more prodigious spectacle. If the human face is the masterpiece of God, it is here then in a thousand fateful registrations. Often the faces speak what words can never say. Some tell of eternity, others only of the latest tattlings. Child faces of blossom smiles or mouths of hunger are followed by homely faces of majesty carved and worn by love, prayer, hope, along with others, light and carefree as thistledown on a late summer wind, faces having land and sea on them, faces honest as the morning sun, flooding a clean kitchen with light, faces crooked and lost and wondering where to go this afternoon or tomorrow morning, faces in crowds laughing and wind-blown leaf faces, profiles in an instant of agony, mouths in a dumb show mockery lacking speech, faces of music in gay song or a twist of pain, a hate ready to kill or calm and ready for death faces, some of them worth a long look now and deep contemplation later, faces betokening a serene blue sky or faces dark with storm winds and lashing night rain, and faces beyond forgetting, written over with faiths in men and dreams of man surpassing himself, an alphabet here and a multiplication table of living, breathing human faces. In the times to come, as in the past, there will be generations taking hold as though loneliness and the genius of struggle has always dwelt in the hearts of pioneers. To the question, what will their story be of the family of man across the near or far future, some would reply for the answers... Read, if you can, the strange and baffling eyes of youth. There is only one man in the world, and his name is all men. There is only one woman in the world, and her name is all women. There is only one child in the world, and the child's name is all children. A drama of the Grand Canyon of Humanity, wrote poet Carl Sandburg, an epic woven of fun, mystery, and holiness. This is the family of man. 
But there is another thing which must be told, and it is this, that the family of man is the family of God as well. For every child born into the family of man is also born into the family of God, a sister or a brother to every other, and a son or daughter of the infinite. Henry M. Stanley wrote during one of his African expeditions that a civilized man, when he becomes hungry, is only 24 hours more advanced than the uncivilized man and only 48 hours ahead of the animal. It is precisely when you see the human being as caught in himself yet transcending himself that you truly perceive the nature of man. The philosopher Bertrand Russell wrote that a person deals with any given situation in accordance with his or her philosophy of that situation. Therefore, of utmost importance is the philosophy of what it is to be a human being. George Bernard Shaw wrote in his book, Sixteen Self-Sketches, that he never did think much of the courage of a lion tamer because inside the cage he is at least safe from other men. What is the essence of human nature? Shakespeare wrote, what a piece of work is man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. There is an ancient myth that each time a star falls across the black night sky, a child is born. We now know, of course, such a belief is not really true, and yet there is a strange poetic appeal to that. Science sometimes steals our superstitions but leaves the poetry behind. For though a meteor may not plunge to earth at every human birth, there remains a truth inherent in that. For here is something of the nature of human beings. That every child receives a twinkling of celestial light in his or her mind to illumine life, the indwelling spirit of the living God. An exquisitely engraved, gleaming, pure silver bell is a mere ornament, not a bell at all, without a tongue, a clapper hung inside it to set it ringing and peeling. And no human being is truly a human being without this inward spiritual dimension. The philosopher Aristotle defined man as the, quote, rational animal, which is like defining the ocean as a great deal of salt water. True, but it says nothing of the vastness, the beauty, the mystery, the power, and the meaning of either the ocean or... Of man. The philosopher Pascal declared man as the glory and the scandal of the universe. In his book Man for Himself, the psychologist Eric Fromm describes a contradiction that man is, quote, both part of nature and yet has the constant urge to transcend nature. At the very heart of the psychologist Carl Rogers, non directive psychotherapy, as summarized in an article in the American Psychologist, is the concept that, quote, the psychiatrist must see his patient as a person of unconditional self-worth. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, which presupposes self-love. Two psychologists, Shearer and Stock, have published an article in the Journal of Consulting Psychologists. It was their finding that people who think well of themselves usually think well of others, and those who disapprove of themselves will disapprove of almost everybody else. Begin with your own self-concept. In the year 334 B.C., Alexander the Great decided that all the peoples he had conquered should be treated as equals. So he decreed that young Persians should be trained in the Greek language and warfare. Alexander's old soldiers didn't like the idea so well. They complained, you're making these barbarians your kinsmen. And Alexander replied, I would make all men my kinsmen. And so they are. Plato once remarked that a man is the opposite of a tree. For a man stands on his branches, but with his roots in the air. He was saying man is nourished by higher things, by the things of the spirit. The Greek author Thucydides said that once the Athenians overcame a tribe and had gathered them on a beach naked for the slaughter, but then decided to set them free, saying this was done because of the nature of man. The nature of man is so high in its origin and destiny that somehow it deserves to be free. Man is a child of the living God. A dirty, smudged, and faded page may yet bear beautiful writing. And how? Because fine writing does not depend upon fine paper. The beauty of writing is in the meaning, not in the printing. And so a homely person is yet a person of beauty because of what that person means in the family of God. All animals eat, but man is the one who sometimes prays before. All animals drink, but man is the one who sometimes drinks to the health of someone else. All animals fight, 
But man is the one who sometimes fights for ideals. All animals grunt and howl and peep and squeal, but man is the one who sometimes calls it a hymn to God. All animals listen, but man is the one who sometimes hears a still small voice within. And all animals die, but man is the one who sometimes dies not in fear, but in expectation. A strange, serene, and faith-filled expectation of eternal life to come. No sooner do we laud man as an exquisite flower than he wilts. No sooner do we damn him as an odious weed than he blossoms. Perhaps this is man, after all, a blossoming weed, the son of earth and son of God. The perplexing paradox, earth-born but heaven-bound, a child of infinity caught in a skirt or suit and necktie, a son of eternity wearing a wristwatch, a citizen of the starry universe going to war over a thin ink line on a paper map. This is man, a seed of faith in a hull of flesh, a layer of dust on an altar of gold, a glowing spirit in an aging body like some lovely, luminous, deep-sea, phosphorescent fish caught in a rotting net. This is man, hope harnessed in uncertainty, a gleaming blade of spiritual aspiration sheathed in a scabbard of dull inertia, immortal longings wrapped in potter's clay, divinity in a clod of dirt. All this is man, and this is you, an infinitely valuable, infinitely beloved son or daughter of the living God. For all your imperfections, your awkwardness, your strivings and failing, you are loved more than I can say and you can know. For the very God whose heart beats at the center of this universe loves you this moment with a love which will not let you go and calls you son or daughter in his family. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.